Love is letting go of fear. Gerald G. Jampolsky To the children of the universe Who by the essence Of their being, love Bring light into a darkened world Contents Part 1 Preparation for Personal Transformation Part 2 Ingredients of Personal Transformation Part 3 Lessons for Personal Transformation Lesson 1 All that I give is given to myself Lesson 2 Forgiveness is the key to happiness Lesson 3 I am never upset for the reason I think Lesson 4 I am determined to see things differently Lesson 5 I can escape from the world I see by giving up attack thoughts. Lesson 6, I am not the victim of the world I see. Lesson 7, today I will judge nothing that occurs. Lesson 8, this instant is the only time their island. Lesson 9, the past is over it can touch me not. Lesson 10, I could see peace instead of this. Lesson 11, I can elect to change all thoughts that hurt. Lesson 12, I am responsible for what I see. Epilogue Preface When I was 54 years old, I embarked on a miraculous journey that began with the publication of my first book, Love is Letting Go of Fear. In fact, in many respects, it was a miracle the book was ever written at all. Dyslexic since childhood, I entered the University of California at Berkeley in 1943 knowing that a dumbbell English course was in my future. I struggled through it and received AD, and on the final day of class my professor said to me, Jem Polsky, I don't know what you are going to do in life, but for God's sake, don't ever try to write a book. I was 50 years old before I decided to no longer give my power away to other people's judgments about my limitations and do what I had been told was impossible and write a book. I am still in awe that this little book has sold millions of copies and been translated into dozens of languages. Miraculous? Absolutely. What's more, at age 85, the journey and the miracles continue for me. Since 1979, the book has grown wings of love that have taken it to just the right people at precisely the right time in their lives. It seems as though the angels have been hovering from above, guiding it to those in need of its simple message. Over the years, I have been fortunate enough to hear from readers who have opened their hearts and changed their lives. Their stories are, to me, miraculous, and I would like to share a few with you that have come my way. The first edition of Love is Letting Go of Fear had been out for several months and was selling steadily, but modestly, when I received a telegram from a person I had never met. His name was Orson Bean, a talented actor and television personality. The telegram simply said, Watch Johnny Carson tonight. Although I rarely stay up late, I did that night. At one point during the interview, Mr. Bean pulled a copy of the book from his pocket saying that it had changed his life. From the next day onward, Love is Letting Go of Fear began its climb up the bestseller list. Since then, whenever people ask me who my public relations person is, I always answer, God. A number of years ago at an event hosted by the Center for Attitudinal Healing, I was approached by a woman who shared the following story. Many years earlier, my son Lee and her son had been close friends in high school. Lee threw a party one night at my office when I was out of town. There was music and alcohol, and the party got a little wild. At one point, her son became a little unsteady on his feet and crashed into some bookshelves, whereupon a book toppled from the shelf and hit him in the head. The book was Love is Letting Go of Fear. He was attracted to the illustrations and decided to take it home. When his mother found the book in his room a month or so later, she decided to read it. At that time she was going through some major life challenges, and she said the book changed her life and she wanted to thank me for writing it all these years later. A book will come to a person when he or she is ready for its message, and often it will come in an amazing way. The truth also comes to people ready or not in some pretty amazing ways. I decided to phone my son Lee just to remind him that the truth will always come out eventually, even if it's years and years after the fact. It has also been gratifying to learn that love's influence has traveled the globe. When teaching in Iran several years ago, 
we were surprised and delighted to learn that Love is Letting Go of Fear and five of our other books had been translated and published in Farsi and were circulating throughout the country. Although these were clearly bootlegged editions, we decided not to make an issue of that fact. It is more important to us that Love's message reaches those who need it. Following a lecture at the University of Tehran, an Iranian professor shared his personal story with us. He and his wife had had a most difficult marriage, marred by constant arguing. At wit's end, he was seriously considering divorce. Although he loved his wife deeply, he yearned for a more peaceful existence and simply couldn't envision a calm relationship with her. One day while browsing in a bookstore, he came across a pirated copy of Love is Letting Go of Fear. As he spoke to us, he spread his arms wide and, smiling, said that simply reading the book was the first step toward saving his marriage. Diane and I made many trips to Russia when it was still the former Soviet Union. During one of our visits to Moscow, as was typical at that time, we were assigned a translator and a guide from the Soviet Tourist Bureau. What we didn't know then was that they actually were KGB agents. We brought with us a number of Russian language editions of both Love is Letting Go of Fear and A Mini Course for Life. Each day our translator asked us for a few copies, which we gladly turned over to her. As the days passed, she asked for more and more copies. Our supply was starting to run low, so we finally asked her where all the books were going. She explained they were being used to teach English to other translators, agents, because the concepts were so new and interesting to them. Needless to say, we were delighted that the study of English was being supplemented by the study of practical spiritual principles that emphasized love and forgiveness. Love is letting go of fear has found its way into the hands of people of all ages and from all walks of life. Following a talk in Florida recently, a 10-year-old girl spoke with us. Her parents' decision to divorce had been deeply upsetting and very confusing. Looking for someone to blame, she wasn't sure which parent to be angry with so she decided to be angry with them both. One afternoon at a friend's house, she saw a copy of Love is Letting Go of Fear and borrowed it. The book's message brought her peace of mind even though her parents continued to threaten each other with divorce. Eventually, she gave the book to her parents to read in the hope it would help them heal their relationship. She then introduced her mother and father who were standing nearby still married, and who enthusiastically validated their daughter's story. An inmate in Arizona wrote me an angry letter claiming that Love is Letting Go of Fear was the worst book he had ever read. He went on to say that if I were in solitary confinement and had been beaten by guards, I would never be able to forgive. He ended his letter with the accusation that I must be some flaky shrink from California who couldn't possibly know what real life was all about. I responded, not with self-righteous indignation, but with an open-minded, non-defensive letter. And so began a lively and mutually rewarding correspondence. While on a lecture tour in Arizona, I arranged to visit him in prison. During our meeting he told me that after rereading the book, he realized it wasn't prison that kept him in bondage, it was the fear he carried in his own mind that was keeping him incarcerated. Some time later, following his release, he began the process of forgiving the significant people in his life. This enabled him to launch a vocation of working with people who had been incarcerated and who were facing death from terminal illness. After a recent lecture on Maui, a woman came up to us in tears. She explained that in 1980 her husband had had an affair. Her anger had been like molten lava, and she had bought a gun with the intention of shooting him a plan that would have irrevocably changed her life. The same day, a friend gave her a copy of Love is Letting Go of Fear. Despite her pain, she read the book and abandoned her dangerous impulse and altered the course of her life in a positive direction. A man attending a workshop conducted by the Center for Attitudinal Healing shared the following story. As an adult, he made the upsetting discovery that his father had been a member of the Nazi party and served in the SS during World War II. Reading Love is Letting Go of Fear had helped him take the necessary steps to get past the shame and anguish and forgive his father for being an active participant during such a cruel period of history. As a result, he decided to make a radical change and gave up his business for a very different kind of vocation. Of all things, he became a clown, 
explaining that the best way he could think of to heal the world was by making his life's work about bringing other people joy and laughter. He described his costume to me, including a huge pair of extra-long shoes. When I asked him why the extra-long shoes, his immediate reply was, so my father can walk along with me in my shoes as we heal the world together. In 2009 alone, this book and its mighty wings landed in Mongolia, Cameroon, Nigeria, Mali, Romania, and so many other places. A woman in Mongolia went through the experience of her deeply loved brother committing suicide. It was a devastating experience that left her deeply depressed. She wrote that after reading Love is Letting Go of Fear she found the tools to heal herself, and her life changed. Since then, she has started the Center for Attitudinal Healing, Mongolia and wants to devote her life to helping others as a way to continue to heal herself. A man in Cameroon, Central Africa, wrote that he had developed three businesses and was quite successful. He had a wife and two children. He became addicted to drugs, and his wife and children left him and his businesses collapsed. In his words, he became a derelict. One Sunday while taking a walk on an out-of-the-way country road, he came across an old man selling used books from a small cart. He saw the title Love is Letting Go of Fear, and with the very last few coins he had, he purchased the book. It became like a Bible to him, and he proceeded to read it more than a dozen times. He stopped using drugs, and his wife and children returned to him. He went on to start a health clinic for her and a new business for himself. He said he was so transformed by the concepts and experience of the book that he has started attitudinal healing support groups and is now in the process of starting a center for attitudinal healing in Cameroon. The former ambassador to Mexico from Nigeria visited the Secura in Mexico City, the first center for attitudinal healing in Mexico. To date, more than 20 Mexican cities have centers or groups. There she located this book and found it began to nourish her spiritually. As an elder stateswoman in her country known for her work in anti-corruption, she became convinced that the concepts and the principles of attitudinal healing were a viable way for an attitudinal shift in her country. She went on television and spoke about this, generating a huge response nationwide and encouragement to go further. She has since incorporated the Center for Attitudinal Healing Nigeria, and the work continues to grow. Love is Letting Go of Fear was written not only for you, but also for me. I still do my best to apply its practical principles to my own life. I find them even more timely, valid, and helpful today than I did 32 years ago. The lessons in love is letting go of fear are grounded on the very same principles from which attitudinal healing has evolved. It was in 1975 that I helped found the first center for attitudinal healing located in Marin County, California. In 198 liters, Diane Serene Choney, Ph.D., came into my life, and we later married. Diane has been both an angelic partner and a teacher of love, peace, patience, gentleness, and forgiveness. After 30 years, the principles in love is letting go of fear are still indispensable to us as a couple and as individuals. We continue to nurture a relationship of equality and unconditional love. Attitudinal healing has become our life work together and has given us the opportunity to meet and speak with people in more than 50 countries throughout the world. Attitudinal healing is based on the principle that it is not other people or situations that ultimately cause us to be upset. Rather, it is our own thoughts and attitudes about those things that are responsible for our distress, and the actions we take as a result of those thoughts and attitudes that can hurt us. Healing results when we concentrate on changing our own attitudes rather than trying to change the attitude of others. Thus, the goal of attitudinal healing is self-healing in the face of each life challenge, regardless of the source. Attitudinal healing is not a religion or religious. It is a practical spirituality that supports and is compatible with all faiths and belief systems. People from many cultures, faiths, and denominations, as well as those who follow no faith at all, are welcome to use the principles of attitudinal healing. The first center for attitudinal healing, founded in Marin County, Northern California, began with support services for children with catastrophic illness and their families. All direct services are free of charge. Over the decades, 
the centers have grown and developed support groups for children and adults facing illness, loss, and grief, as well as school programs focused on violence prevention through peer support and award-winning home and hospital visitation programs. Support groups for men and women continue, as do groups for bereavement and spousal and caregiver support during challenges, crisis, and change. Workshops for businesses that wish to apply the principles of attitudinal healing in the professional environment are also being offered. At the core of these principles is forgiveness. Forgiveness does not mean condoning or agreeing with a horrendous act. It is a decision to no longer attack oneself. Forgiveness is, quite simply, the decision not to suffer. To forgive is to make the decision to be happy, to let go of judgments, to stop hurting others and ourselves, and to stop recycling anger and fear. Forgiveness is the bridge to compassion, to inner peace, and to a peaceful world. It is my hope that forgiveness becomes as important, as involuntary to us, as breathing. To my utter amazement attitudinal healing is now worldwide, in hundreds of locations consisting of centers and support groups in 30 countries on five continents. Love is letting go of fear has served, and still serves, as the cornerstone of our work. It is our hope that this little book will continue to find its readers, one at a time, when the time is just right. It is our prayer that as we heal our own minds of fear and negativity, the world we see will be healed along with us. Jerry Jempolsky, Sausalito, California January 1st, 2011 Author's Note We teach what we want to learn, and I want to learn to experience inner peace. In 1975, the outside world saw me as a successful psychiatrist who appeared to have everything he wanted. But my inner world was chaotic, empty, unhappy, and hypocritical. My 20-year marriage had recently ended in a painful divorce. I had become a heavy drinker and had developed chronic, disabling back pain as a means of handling guilt. It was at this time that I came across some writings entitled A Course in Miracles. The course could be described as a form of spiritual psychotherapy that is self-taught. I was perhaps more surprised than anyone when I became involved in a thought system that uses words like God and love. I had thought that I would be the last person interested in such writings. I had been extremely judgmental toward people who pursued a spiritual pathway, I saw them as fearful, and I believed they were not using their intellect properly. When I first began studying the course, I had an experience that was surprising but also very comforting. I heard an inner voice or possibly it would be more accurate to say an impression of a voice, which said to me, Physician, heal thyself, this is your way home. I found the course essential in my struggle for personal transformation. It helped me recognize that I really did have a choice of experiencing peace or conflict, and that this choice is always between accepting truth or illusion. The underlying truth for all of us is that the essence of our being is love. The Course states that there are only two emotions, love and fear. The first is our natural inheritance, and the other our mind manufactures. The Course suggests that we can learn to let go of fear by practicing forgiveness and seeing everyone, including ourselves, as blameless and guiltless. By applying the concepts of the Course to both my professional and personal life, I began to experience periods of peace that I had never dreamed possible. I would like to add that I still get depressed and at times feel guilty, irritable, and angry. These moods now last for only brief periods, whereas they used to last for what seemed eternity. I used to feel that I was a victim of the world I saw. When things would go wrong, I would blame the world or those in it for my misery and feel justified in my anger. Today, I know I am not a victim of the world I see and therefore tend to take responsibility for whatever I perceive and for the emotions I experience. We are all teachers of each other. I have written this book because I believe that in teaching what I want to learn, inner peace, I can become more consistent in achieving it for myself. This approach is not for people who want gurus, since it views everyone equally as both a teacher and a student. As each of us moves toward the single goal of achieving peace of mind for ourselves, we can also experience the joining of our minds that follows the removal of the blocks to our awareness of love's presence. Together, therefore, let us demonstrate in our own lives this statement from A Course in Miracles.
Teach only love for that is what you are. Jerry Jampolsky Tiburon, California May 1, 1979 Love is the way I walk in gratitude. Forward Love is letting go of fear is the sweetest, gentlest healing melody to my heart. Its principles have had a profound effect on me. It has influenced how I see and hold myself, how I conduct my relationships with others, and how I look at the world. It has helped me find a sense of inner peace, joy and happiness beyond what I had ever experienced before, or ever thought possible. This amazing book for personal growth has been helping millions of people around the world since it was first published in 1979. After 30 years and even more than before, it offers a timely tonic in these complex and often troubling times. I love the straightforward practicality of the lessons and the thought-provoking illustrations that make the book cross-culturally appealing and so reader-friendly for, literally, all ages. Jerry's writings have a heartfelt honesty, simplicity and integrity about them, just like him, which really works for me when dealing with complicated issues in everyday life. The inclusion in this new edition of how people can deal differently with financial insecurity and the fear that comes with it is always timely. Especially useful are Jerry's thoughts on how applying attitudinal healing principles can help get us out of a state of victimhood, no matter what has happened to us. Living these principles has proven to me that I can choose to be in a state of inner peace and outer harmony even when there is chaos going on all around me. This revelation was life-changing for me as it will be to many readers regardless of their politics, culture, or faith. Whether it is my music, my band, my family life, my audience, or my business, when all said and done, it is my relationships and how I handle them have become the top priorities in my life along with my spiritual growth. Seeing the value of releasing guilt and grievances about myself and others has opened up new vistas for me. I love quoting Bishop Desmond Tutu, who said, there can be no future without forgiveness. I have been fortunate to know Jerry and his partner and spouse, Dr. Diane Serene Choney, for a number of years, and it has been inspiring for me to witness how diligent they are in practicing these principles in their own lives. It is my hope that this treasure of a book will empower people to heal all of their relationships, to motivate themselves and inspire others to make a difference, and to bring love and light into a world that is suffering in darkness. So if you wish to find a way of removing all the barriers that block you from experiencing love, if you wish to learn how to create a future that is different from the past, if you wish to learn to take responsibility for your own happiness and have a lasting sense of inner peace, then read on. Peace. Carlos Santana. Introduction. Love is Letting Go of Fear has had an amazing journey since its first edition was printed in 1979. No one could be more surprised than I at the journey this book has taken. It has sold millions of copies, has been published in dozens of languages, and continues to be a classic after all these many years. This book is about inner healing and spiritual transformation. In many ways, I wrote this book for myself. Being dyslexic and a slow reader, I like books that are reader-friendly, have larger print than usual, and have cartoons to help make the writing easier to understand. The core principles are about having a willingness to see the world differently, seeing value in letting go of our control issues, judgments and grievances, and making forgiveness as important as breathing. The principles in this book apply to every aspect of our lives, including our relationships with other people and with objects such as money and material things. In celebrating the third edition of this book some 30 plus years after its first edition was published, it seemed like it would be helpful to take a look back. I wanted to contrast my impressions about what I was like during those first 50 years with my reflections about the second part of my life after I began to incorporate the lessons in this book. The first part of my life I thought of myself as not being good enough and not being very smart when it came to academics as I usually was in the bottom of my class. I was an undiagnosed dyslexic, a very fearful kid who grew up to be a fearful adult. I was shy, judgmental of myself as well as others, always wondering when the next brick was going to come down from the sky and hit me on the head. My fear made me overly controlling and at the same time fearful of intimacy. On the one hand I always had a mission of wanting to help other people, 
and on the other hand I wanted to make a lot of money. Although the world saw me as successful, I was not a very happy camper and my inner life was miserable. I married when I was 29 years old, had two sons, and had a marriage that looked great from the outside but was very challenging from the inside. What was important to me was financial security, how much money I had in the bank, and the kind of house and neighborhood I lived in. What other people thought of me seemed terribly important. I was a fault finder to others, but also to myself. Emotionally, I was on a treadmill machine going at high speed, and I was not capable of slowing the machine or stopping it to get off. My ego seemed to have me in a stranglehold. No matter how much money I made, it was never enough. We seemed to be always spending more than we were making. At one point I bought a green Austin Healy and had a green hat that went with it. I was sure it would bring me lasting happiness. And of course, that did not happen. I projected my unhappiness onto my wife, and a 20-year marriage ended in a painful divorce. I soon turned to alcohol to hide my pain. I denied I was an alcoholic even after I was stopped by the police for driving under the influence of alcohol. Most of my friends were either heavy drinkers or alcoholics who denied they had an alcohol problem. During this time I was an atheist, and in my judgmental way I thought that people who were religious or spiritual were this way because they were fearful. I remember being proud of my atheistic stand and how I viewed life. I do remember brief times of happiness. But most of what I remember of those days was a life where I had little if any inner peace. A lingering feeling kept bobbing up that I didn't deserve to be happy. I was 50 years old when I consciously started my spiritual journey. Before that I had no idea how hard I could be on myself or others. The word forgiveness had little meaning. However, I began slowly but surely to see the beneficial effects of being willing to forgive others and, especially, myself. By practicing the lessons in A Course in Miracles and Love is Letting Go of Fear, I began to experience a sense of inner peace that I never had before, and I had never thought was possible. I began to sense, then believe in, what I call inner knowing and that there is a higher power that could, if I were willing, direct my life into a consciousness of love, giving and helping others. My focus on money and material things began to disappear. I was totally absorbed in helping as I started the first center for attitudinal healing. I began to experience how everyone I met, or even thought about, was my teacher. Finally, I discovered I could make inner peace as my only goal, and forgiveness as my only function. I learned to listen to an inner voice of love directing what I thought, said, and did. As I have advanced in chronological years, I have become more mellow and realize that I don't know what is best for others but that each of us has an inner teacher that can show us the way. If I find myself in stress, I am more aware now that I have some more forgiving to do. As I have let go of some of the blocks I have put in the way of my experiencing love, I am more compassionate and focused on living in this present moment than doing what I used to do by getting caught in worrying about the fearful future and the fearful past. In general I am more of a happy camper. I am not trying to change other people or their attitudes. I do my best to be a vehicle of love with everyone and not withhold or exclude my love from anyone, including myself. I laugh a lot more as I keep the six-year-old kid inside me, active, alive, curious, and playful. I don't take myself so seriously. I am more careful about what I eat, and I exercise regularly and go to the gym several times a week. Working with families with children who are facing death has shown me that there is another way of looking at living and dying in life and death. They have also taught me the value of living one day at a time and the great importance of discovering that it is always possible to have gratitude in one's life. They have taught me that it is possible to experience peace of mind even when chaos is going on all around me or in my body. The people who I spend most of my time with are no longer alcoholics. They are like-minded and like-hearted people who are also on a spiritual pathway and who believe that nothing is impossible. They also, like myself, tend to believe that it is possible to retrain our minds to believe that there are only two emotions, love or fear, and to see our fear as a call of help for love. The year L9AL was another turning point in my life when Diane Serene Choni showed up. 
I believe the angels were working overtime that day when I discovered my soul mate. I don't think that was an accident or would have happened if I had not been able to let go of the shame and guilt I had been harboring in my own jail cell, resulting in my lack of self-love. Diane became an amazing partner and teacher for me of unconditional love, patience, gentleness, kindness, and forgiveness. Our joint goal became to demonstrate and teach only love. It has been a miraculous journey where our higher power, our source, God, or whatever word you might wish to call it has become the most important thing in our relationship. As far as how I look at my aging process is concerned, I now believe it is more important to count your smile wrinkles than your aging wrinkles. I think that age is but an abstract number, and that my mind knows no limitations. In the first part of my life I was fearful of aging and of death, but now I no longer have these fears. I feel the age I am now is the best one yet and the best is yet to come. And in those first 50 years I believed there was a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and it was my goal to find that pot of gold. Now I realize that we are the rainbow, the pot of gold is love, and that is what we actually are. Am I always in a blissful spiritual space? Of course not. I am a work in process and believe I will be a work in process as long as I remain in this body. Every day there are challenges around judgments of others and myself. I have periods of impatience and irritation and not feeling at peace with myself. What is different now is that these periods are much shorter in duration, when I choose to remember, as constantly as I can, that it is only my own thoughts and attitudes that can hurt me. As I look at the world and what has happened to it since this book was first published, there has been amazing progress made in the field of medicine and in the treatment of diseases and traumas, and in the scientifically established relationship between the body and the mind. There has been awesome progress in so many different areas of technology. The first edition of this book I wrote in longhand on a yellow pad. The advancement of computers, the ability to communicate information instantaneously any place in the world on the internet, and the advent of social networks, and on and on, all these have changed the world. There are many people and philanthropic organizations, businesses, and individuals who are doing important work to help the disadvantaged in the world. But at the same time, again through my eyes, fear continues to play a major role in why we are not more loving, compassionate, kind, gentle, and understanding with each other and ourselves. We continue to have major problems in getting along and living in harmony with our families, with our communities, with our country and other countries, and with our planet. There are millions of children and adults who are starving and others who are living below the poverty line, who do not have enough food to eat or proper health care. Addiction problems are on the increase as are physical and sexual abuse. The rate of suicide is increasing in the armed services as it is in several countries. More jails are being built. Our educational system is in dire need of help, even as our military budget continues to go sky high. There are fears and concerns among many about the economic toll and political and spiritual impacts that wars throughout the world have been taking. There are fears about the possibility of nuclear war, fears about global warming, and whether or not these problems can really be solved. There are fears about drug wars, culture wars, religious wars, and wars over natural resources, and how they affect the world. But perhaps the fears at the top of the list for many people are about financial instability and of terrorism. Because I am on a spiritual pathway does not mean there have not been those moments when I have had my own fears around money or the harm that could come to me through terrorist activity. It is my impression that my attitudes and thoughts have a direct effect on how I and others deal with safety, money, and material possessions. There is certainly nothing wrong with money. What gets us into trouble is our attachment to money, which can lead to our making it have more value to us than our relationships. At the end of our lives when we reflect back on what has been most important to us, most people will agree that it has been loving relationships, not how much money we had in the bank. In recent times, as in many other times in history, there has been a cyclic phenomenon where there is a tremendous focus on money and material things, on not having enough. People's worst fears seem to have come true, in that so many have lost their jobs, their homes, and even their retirement savings that they had planned for and worked so hard to achieve. 
The financial crisis has had serious consequences around the world. People got angry, blaming everyone and everything they could think of. It has been all too easy to fall into the deep hole of victimhood. Many found it impossible to experience any sense of peace when the force of these economic failures entered their lives. When the traumatic events of life happen, some never recover and people continue to feel bitter, angry and unhappy the rest of their lives. They continue to scratch their injuries so continuously that their wounds never heal. Others seem able to experience their fearful and bitter emotions but not get stuck in them, to forgive the past, and choose to make their loving relationships more important than money and material things. These people refuse to live in the past, they choose not to worry. They see worry as a waste of time because, in actuality, worrying doesn't work. Against the majority of current world belief, they refuse to believe that the fearful past is going to predict a fearful future. They refuse to allow themselves to be pessimists and choose instead to live with an optimistic attitude. They seem to know they can choose to be peaceful internally no matter what is happening in the external world. Fear can be known as the most virulent and damaging virus known to humankind. Most of the world's belief system of how we communicate with each other and ourselves is based on fear. Let's explore just a few of the beliefs of the world's ego thought system as it is related to money and material things. Our ego's laws are based on the belief that our happiness depends on how much money we have in the bank and how many possessions we own. Its voice of fear bombards us with an attitude of greed, thinking of ourselves first, and getting as much as we can and holding on to it. The fear that is the nucleus of our egos gives us an insatiable desire and hunger to consume more, more, and an unending consumption of more. Our ego's cardinal rule is that nothing is ever enough, seek but never find what you are looking for. Build your life with the fear of scarcity every step of the way. For example, our egos can deceive us into believing if we just could have one million dollars in the bank, we would have peace of mind for the rest of our lives, and we would feel secure. Our fearful ego mind, the king of deception, would then come in with the thought that one million dollars is not enough to give me peace of mind and happiness, what I really need is two million dollars to feel consistently happy and peaceful. Our egos would not want us to believe that love, peace and happiness are the enemy. So what generally happens when we follow the belief in the world's fear-based laws around attitudes when there is financial insecurity and we have lost our jobs, our homes and our retirement savings that we're going to make for a safe and secure future? Our egos motivate us to believe that we will feel more peaceful and happy if we find someone to blame and direct our anger at that person. So we develop an attitude that our egos call healthy, which is to have a raging anger at bankers, mortgage loan officers, and politicians, we make up an enemy list in our minds. And when our justified anger does not seem to be enough, we add on to the list our anger at the world, God, and finally ourselves. The trouble is, we soon discover that it is just about impossible to experience peace of mind and justified anger at the same time. When we get caught in the ego's thought system, our beliefs are created from the fear that the past is going to predict the future and the future is going to be just like the past. I have witnessed some people who, when financial insecurity comes their way, continue to feed on their anger and bitterness and lack of trust the rest of their lives. They seem to go around and around in circles, with peace, intimacy and love escaping them. They do not still their minds and find new creative solutions for the problems they face. They superimpose the past onto the present and future and thus continue to recreate what they least want to experience. There are others I have known who have faced their human feelings without getting stuck in them and have forgiven the world and themselves. They spend their lives in a giving and helping attitude. The attitude they carry with them is an optimistic one, believing that when one door closes, another door will open. They are on the lookout for ways they can help others even during bad times and they are not afraid to reposition themselves. They remind themselves with gratitude that the love they have and give to others is the greatest treasure they could have, and it's a treasure that no one can ever take away from them. Some years ago, Diane and I were guest lecturers on a conference titled, The Power Healing Power of Laughter and Play in Boston, Massachusetts. We were surprised to be met at the airport by two clowns. 
I started a conversation with the clown next to me and asked him his story about how he became a clown. His story was amazing. He was a 63-year-old businessman who had been quite successful. In L987 he lost almost everything he had in the economic downturn. He stated that he became depressed and angry at himself for his poor judgments, and he was always feeling fearful of the future. One day he read in the newspaper that there was going to be a night course on clowning to be given at a local college near him. He could not believe it when he found himself signing up for the course. He told me that this decision saved his life. He changed his lifestyle, including where he lived. He goes to hospitals and schools and helps children learn how to laugh. He enjoys giving his love to children and making them laugh, and the more he does this the happier he is. His last words to us were that he had never known he could be this happy. People like him show us that we can suffer economic loss and see it as an opportunity for a spiritual transformation. We can make giving more important than getting, we can begin to see love as more important than material things. We can begin to feel that love actually is the answer to all our problems. There are many of us who would rank our huge fear of terrorists along with fears about money and the lack of it at the top of our pyramid of fears. So far I don't think that anyone has come up with a successful plan that people agree on to rid the world of terrorists, they seem so elusive and hard to find. Would you consider that the hate, anger, grievances, lack of forgiveness, and murder, either in words or actions, seem justified to the persons performing the acts of terrorism? Would you be willing to consider that such decisions are based on fear rather than love? And would you rewind our history and observe that since the beginning of humankind, there has been an amazing amount of fear and terror in one form or another that we have passed along in our teachings from one generation to another. Terrorists come in many different forms, political persuasions, skin colors, sizes, and have different religious beliefs, they are rich people, poor people, governmental agencies, and heads of state. Their attacks are often sudden and unexpected where thousands upon thousands of innocent people have been killed, and the perpetrators often feel righteous and justified about what they have done. In attempts to understand the world and myself, I have found cartoons to be extremely helpful and insightful. I, along with thousands of others, remember the famous Pogo cartoon that stated, We have met the enemy and he is us. Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, famous psychiatrist, now deceased, was known for her work on death and dying. She once said, there is a little bit of Hitler in each of us. When I first heard this statement, I resented it. I said to myself, I hate Hitler, and there is no Hitler in me. I was then in denial of my ego, whose center is fear, conflict, hate, revenge, and murder. Then I began to remember when my sons were in grammar school and they left their rooms a mess, how there were occasions when I lost my temper and would shout at them, trying to control them by making them fearful, not realizing I was causing terror in them by my loud outbursts of anger. Is not a terrorist someone who causes another person to feel terrified? And what about bullies in school who create terror in kids who are smaller than them? Isn't bullying another form of terrorism? Another form of fear? Many of us have had the experience of being so angry that in our minds there is a wish that the other person would die or just disappear from the face of the earth, a wish and thought that can be considered as a disguised form of murder. If our thoughts are as powerful as our actions, could that be considered as the beginnings of a terrorist thought within ourselves? Is it just possible that Pogo was correct and that the enemy is within our minds when we allow ourselves to believe that anger and hate will get us what we want? Is it not possible that to heal the outside world we first need to do inner healing of our own fears, attack thoughts, and hatred? Questions and more questions continue to be asked. Can we get out of the mess that the world we see seems to be in? Is there an alternative to destroying each other and ourselves and the planet we live on? Will hate and violence always be a part of our lives? Is this a dream world? A world of illusions and insanity made up by our egos that blocks the awareness of the presence of love? The concepts in this book can help heal our minds and our hearts. They can open the door to making all of our decisions based on love rather than fear.
they can assist us in committing ourselves to go through each day with the vigorous determination that we will have no thoughts, attitudes, words, or actions that are hurtful to others or ourselves. The lessons in this book are based on the belief that only our own thoughts and attitudes create our reality, and that it is only our own thoughts and attitudes that can hurt us, or heal us. I like reminding myself of my friend, Hugh Prather, who states, there must be another way of going through life besides being pulled though kicking and screaming. I do believe that there is another way of going through life, and it requires an open mind, a willingness to change our beliefs and to change our goal. There is increasing recognition among people everywhere that we are destroying ourselves and the world in which we live. Many of us, myself included, have felt the futility of trying to rid ourselves of frustration, conflict, pain, and illness, while still holding on to old belief systems. We do not seem to be able to change the world, to change other people, or to change ourselves until we are willing to change our own minds. Today there is a rapidly expanding search for a better way of going through life that is uncovering a new awareness and a change in consciousness. It is like a spiritual flood that is about to cleanse the earth. This transformation of consciousness is prompting us to look inward, and as we explore our inner spaces we recognize the harmony and at one meant that has always been there. As we look inward, we also become aware of an inner intuitive voice that provides a reliable source for guidance. When the physical senses are hushed, and we listen to the inner voice and surrender to it, moments of true healing and growth occur. In this silence, where the conflict of personalities has ceased to interest us, we can experience the joy of peace in our lives. Although we want to experience peace, most of us are still seeking something else that we never find. We are still trying to control and predict, and therefore we feel isolated, disconnected, separate, alone, fragmented, unloved, and unlovable. We never seem to get enough of what we think we want, and our satisfactions are highly transitory. Even with those people we are close to, we often have love-hate relationships. These are relationships in which we feel a need to get something from someone else, when the need is fulfilled, we love them, and when it is not fulfilled, we hate them. Many of us are finding that, even after obtaining all the things we wanted in terms of job, home, family, and money, there is still an emptiness inside. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, India, called this phenomenon spiritual deprivation. Throughout the world there is a growing recognition of the need to feel fulfillment within, rather than to rely on the external symbols of success. When we have a desire to get something from another person or the world and we are not successful, the result is stress expressed in the form of frustration, depression, perceptions of pain, illness, and death. Most of us seriously want to get rid of the pain, illness, and frustrations, but we still want to maintain the old self-concept. Perhaps that is why we are going in circles, because we rigidly hold on to our old belief systems. The world that seems so insane is the result of a belief system that is not working. To perceive the world differently, we must be willing to change our belief system, heal our relationship with our past, and expand our sense of now by releasing the fear in our minds. This changed perception leads to the recognition that we are not separate, but that we have always been joined. There are many valid ways that lead to transformation and inner peace. This small book has been written as a primer for those of us who are motivated to experience personal transformation toward a life of giving and love, and away from getting and fear. In brief, this is a book about self-fulfillment through giving. The words and drawings present practical applications of steps for transformation in everyday situations that all of us face. This book is intended to help us remove the blocks to the awareness of love's presence in our lives. We can learn to retrain our minds to have the single goal of peace of mind and the single function of practicing forgiveness. Our fulfillment can come from listening to the voice of our inner teacher. And in so doing, we will learn to heal our relationships, experience peace of mind, and let go of fear. My present happiness is all I see. All fear is past and only love is here. What is real? Most of us are confused about what is real. Even though we sense there is something more, we attempt to settle for a reality based exclusively on feedback from our physical senses. To reinforce this reality, 
we look to what our culture defines as normal, healthy, and therefore real. Yet where does love fit into this scheme of things? Wouldn't our lives be more meaningful if we looked to what has no beginning and no ending as our reality? Only love fits this definition of the eternal. Everything else is transitory and therefore meaningless. Fear always distorts our perception and confuses us as to what is going on. Love is the total absence of fear. Love asks no questions. Its natural state is one of extension and expansion, not comparison and measurement. Love, then, is really everything that is of value, and fear can offer us nothing because it is nothing. Although love is always what we want, we are often afraid of love without consciously knowing it, and so we may act both blind and deaf to love's presence. Yet, when we help ourselves and each other let go of fear, we begin to experience a personal transformation. We start to see beyond our old reality as defined by the physical senses, and we enter a state of clarity in which we discover that all minds are joined, that we share a common self, and that inner peace and love are in fact all that are real. With love as our only reality, health and wholeness can be viewed as inner peace, and healing can be seen as letting go of fear. Love, then, is letting go of fear. Replaying the past We all manufacture our own dust and static that serve only to interfere with seeing, hearing, and experiencing love within ourselves and others. This self-imposed interference keeps us stuck in an old belief system that we use repeatedly, even though it doesn't get us what we want. The mind can be thought of as containing reels and reels of motion picture film about our past experiences. These images are superimposed not only on each other but also on the lens through which we experience the present. Consequently, we are never really seeing or hearing it as it is, we are just seeing fragments of the present through the tons of distorted old memories that we layer over it. If we are willing, we can with increasing effectiveness use active imagination to wipe away everything from those old reels except love. This requires letting go of our past attachments to guilt and fear. Prediction versus Peace Sometimes we put more value in predicting and controlling than in having peace of mind. At times, it feels more important for us to predict that we are going to be miserable the next moment, and then find pleasure in being right, than to have true happiness in the present moment. This can be looked upon as an insane way of trying to protect ourselves. It produces a short circuit that confuses pleasure with pain. We often believe that the fears of the past can successfully predict the fears of the future. The results of this type of thinking are that we spend most of our time worrying about both the past and future, creating a vicious circle of fear, which leaves little room for love and joy in the present. Choice for reality We can choose our own reality. Because our will is free, if we wish we can choose to see and experience the truth. We can experience the truth of our reality as love. To do this, we must, each instant, refuse to be limited by the fearful past and future and by the questionable realities we have adopted from our culture. We can choose to experience this instant as the only time there is, and live in a reality of now. Because our minds have no boundaries, they are actually joined. In fact, our minds have only the limitations we place on them. For example, when we see value in making a fearful past real, we limit our minds to using it as our reality. As a result, our minds can only look fearfully at all that is to come, and cannot pause for an instant to enjoy the present in peace. When we use words such as can't and impossible, we have imposed the limits of a fearful past on ourselves. Singleness of Goal Peace of mind is our single goal is the most potent motivating force we can have. To have inner peace we need to be consistent in having peace of mind as our single goal. Instead of having a single goal, we are all tempted to try to juggle multiple goals. Juggling can only serve to deflect our focus and increase our conflict. We can achieve consistency in keeping this single goal in mind by reminding ourselves of the singleness of purpose we would have if we suddenly found ourselves drowning in the ocean. We would, in that situation, put all of our attention into the single goal of staying afloat and breathing for survival. Peace of mind through forgiveness with peace of mind as our single goal, forgiveness becomes our single function. Forgiveness is the vehicle used for correcting our misperceptions and for helping us let go of fear. 
Simply stated, to forgive is to let go. Our first step in mind retraining is to establish peace of mind as our single goal. This means thinking of ourselves first in terms of self-fullness, not selfishness. The second step is forgiveness. Many of us become frustrated when we make the mistake of trying to love others as the first step. In light of our past distorted values and experiences, some people simply seem unlovable, because of our faulty perception of their behavior, it is difficult to love them. When we have peace of mind as a single goal, we can then take the second step, forgiveness, and choose to see others as extending love, or being fearful and calling for help in the form of love. With this new perception, it becomes easier to give both total love and acceptance to the other person and therefore to experience inner peace at the same time. Other people do not have to change for us to experience peace of mind. Mind is split. It may be useful to think of the mind as the film, the camera, and everything else involved in movie production. What we experience is really our state of mind projected outward upon a screen called the world. This world and those in it become the mirror of our thoughts and fantasies. What the mind projects becomes our perception, which limits our vision as long as we hold to it. The mind functions as if it were split, part of it acts as if it were directed by our egos, and part of it by love. Most of the time, our mind pays attention to this pushy pseudo-director that we call the ego, which is simply another name for fear. The ego directs movies about separation and conflict, although it makes them appear as if they were the realization of our romantic fantasies. It directs movies that project the illusion that we are all separate from each other. Our true director, love, does not project illusions, it only extends the truth. Love directs movies that unite and join us to one another. The mind is actually the director, producer, scriptwriter, film editor, cast, projectionist, audience, and critic. The mind, being limitless, has the capacity of changing the movie and everything about it at any time. The mind has the power of making all decisions. The ego part of the mind acts like a curtain of fear and guilt that blocks out love. We can learn to direct our minds to open the curtain and reveal the light of love that has always been there and remains our true reality. When we choose only love as the director of our mind, we can experience the power and the miracle of love. Themes to Life By In making practical application of the material covered in this book to everyday solutions, it will be helpful to keep the following underlying themes in mind. 1. Peace of mind is our single goal. 2. Forgiveness is our single function and the way to achieve our goal of peace of mind. 3. Through forgiveness, we can learn not to judge others and to see everyone, including ourselves, as guiltless. 4. We can let go of fear when we stop judging and stop projecting the past into the future, and live only in the now. 5. We can learn to accept direction from our inner intuitive voice, which is our guide to knowing. 6. After our inner voice gives us direction, it will also provide the means for accomplishing whatever is necessary. 7. In following one's inner guidance, it is frequently necessary to make a commitment to a specific goal even when the means for achieving it are not immediately apparent. This is a reversal of the customary logic of the world, and can be thought of as putting the cart before the horse. 8. We do have a choice in determining what we perceive and the feelings we experience. 9. Through retraining of the mind we can learn to use positive active imagination. Positive active imagination enables us to develop positive, loving motion pictures in our minds. This day I choose to spend in perfect peace. I see all things as I would have them be. Belief systems and reality. We are what we believe. Our belief system is based on our past experience, which is constantly being relived in the present with an anticipation of the future being just like the past. Our present perceptions are so colored by the past that we are unable to see the immediate happenings in our lives without distortion and limitations. With willingness, we can re-examine who we think we are in order to achieve a new and deeper sense of our real identity. We are all limitless. To experience this sense of total freedom, it is important for us to detach ourselves from past future preoccupations and choose to live in the now. To be free also means not to be confined to the reality that seems limited by our physical senses. 
To be free allows us to participate in the love we share with everyone. We cannot be free until we discipline and retrain our minds. While all of us want love, many of us seem unable to experience it. Our guilty fears from the past block our ability to give and receive love in the present. Fear and love can never be experienced at the same time. It is always our choice as to which of these emotions we want. By choosing love more consistently than fear, we can change the nature and quality of our relationships. Attack and Defense When we perceive another person as attacking us, we usually feel defensive and find a way, directly or indirectly, to attack back. Attacking always stems from fear and guilt. No one attacks unless he first feels threatened and believes that through attack he can demonstrate his own strength, at the expense of another's vulnerability. Attack is really a defense and, as with all defenses that are designed to keep guilt and fear from our awareness, attack actually preserves the problem. Most of us cling to the belief that attacking can really get us something we want. We seem to forget that attacking and defending do not bring us inner peace. In order to experience peace instead of conflict, it is necessary to shift our perception. Instead of seeing others as attacking us, we can see them as fearful. We are always expressing either love or fear. Fear is really a call for help, and therefore a request for love. It is apparent, then, that to experience peace we must recognize that we do have a choice in determining what we perceive. Many of our attempts to correct others, even when we believe we are offering constructive criticism, are really attempts to attack them by demonstrating their wrongness and our rightness. It may be helpful to examine our motivations. Are we teaching love or are we demonstrating attack? If others do not change in accordance with our expectations, we are likely to regard them as guilty, and thus reinforce our own belief in guilt. Peace of mind comes from not wanting to change others, but by simply accepting them as they are. True acceptance is always without demands and expectations. Inner peace can be reached only when we practice forgiveness. Forgiveness is the letting go of the past, and is therefore the means for correcting our misperceptions. Our misperceptions can only be undone now, and can be accomplished only through letting go whatever we think other people have done to us, or whatever we think we have done to them. Through this process of selective forgetting, we become free to embrace a present without the need to reenact our past. Through true forgiveness we can stop the endless recycling of guilt and look upon ourselves and others with love. Forgiveness releases all thoughts that seem to separate us from each other. Without the belief in separation, we can accept our own healing and extend healing love to all those around us. Healing results from the thought of unity. As inner peace is recognized as our single goal, forgiveness becomes our single function. When we accept both our goal and our function, we find that our inner, intuitive voice becomes our only guide to fulfillment. We are released as we release others from the prison of our distorted and illusory perceptions, and join with them in the unity of love. Getting and Giving It is important to remember that we have everything we need now, and that the essence of our being is love. If we think we need to get something from another, we will love that person when we get what we think we want, and we will hate that person when we do not. We frequently have love-hate relationships in which we find ourselves trading conditional love, the getting motivation leads to conflict and distress and is associated with linear time. Giving means extending one's love with no conditions, no expectations, and no boundaries. Peace of mind occurs, therefore, when we put all our attention into giving and have no desire to get anything from, or to change, another person. The giving motivation leads to a sense of inner peace and joy that are unrelated to time. Retraining the mind to aid in retraining your mind, remember to ask yourself the following questions in all circumstances, private or interpersonal. 1. Do I choose to experience peace of mind or do I choose to experience conflict? 2. Do I choose to experience love or fear? 3. Do I choose to be a love finder or a fault finder? 4. Do I choose to be a love giver or a love sender? 5. Is this communication? verbal or nonverbal, loving to the other person and is it loving to me? Many of our thoughts, statements, and actions are not loving. If we want peace of mind, 
it is essential that our communications with others bring about a sense of joining. To have inner peace and to experience love, we must be consistent in what we think, say, and do. Words to eliminate Another process for retraining the mind has to do with recognizing the impact of the words we use. The words in the list that follows are commonly used in the messages we give to ourselves and others. The use of these words continues to keep the guilty past and fearful future active in our minds. As a result, our feelings of conflict can only be reinforced. The more we recognize that using these words interferes with our inner peace, the easier it will be to practice eliminating them from our thoughts and expressions. You may find it helpful to carry an imaginary disposal bag in your mind. Every time you use one of these words, visualize yourself putting the word into the disposal bag and then burying it. It is important always to be gentle with yourself. If you find yourself continuing to use any of the words that follow, merely regard it as a mistake to be corrected and choose not to feel guilty about making the mistake. The words to avoid using are impossible, can't, try, limitation, if only, but, however, difficult, ought to, should. Any words that place you or anyone else in a category. Any words that tend to measure or evaluate you or other people. Any words that tend to judge or condemn you or someone else. Conclusion this book provides guidelines for letting go of fear and bringing about inner peace. Its practical applications can help shift our perceptions so that we no longer feel separate, fearful, or in conflict, but rather experience joining, love, and peace. Inner peace is experienced as we learn to forgive the world and everyone in it, and thereby see everyone, including ourselves, as blameless. Each instant of our lives can be regarded as a present opportunity for a new awakening or rebirth, free from the irrelevant intrusion of memories from the past and anticipations of the future. In the freedom of this present moment, we can extend our natural loving nature. When we find ourselves irritated, depressed, angry, or ill, we can be sure we have chosen the wrong goal and are responding to fear. When we are not experiencing joy, we have forgotten to make peace of mind our single goal and have become concerned about getting rather than giving. By consistently choosing love rather than fear, we can experience a personal transformation that enables us to be more naturally loving to ourselves and others. In this way we can begin to recognize and experience the love and joy that unite us. Review 1. One of the main purposes of time is to enable us to choose what we want to experience. Do we want to experience peace or do we want to experience conflict? 2. All minds are joined and are one. 3. What we perceive through our physical senses presents us with a limited and distorted view of reality. 4. We really cannot change the external world or other people. We can change how we perceive the world, how we perceive others, and how we perceive ourselves. 5. There are only two emotions one is love and the other is fear. Love is our true reality. Fear is something our mind has made up, and is therefore unreal. 6. What we experience is our state of mind projected outward. If our state of mind is one of well-being, love, and peace, that is what we will project and therefore experience. If our state of mind is one filled with doubt, fear, and concern about illness, we will project this state outward and it will therefore be our experiential reality. Forgiveness ends all suffering and loss. How to proceed with the lessons. The specific principles and guidelines found in this book gain personal meaning through the practice of the daily lessons. You may find some of them difficult to accept or have trouble seeing their relevance to the problems you face in your own life. These uncertainties do not really matter. However, your willingness to practice the lessons without exceptions is important. It is the experience resulting from the practice that will help you approach your goal of greater personal happiness. Remember that willingness does not imply mastery, only a readiness to change one's perceptions. Suggestions for deriving maximum benefit from the lessons 1. Beginning with Lesson 1, do the lessons sequentially, one each day. 2. Every day on awakening. Relax and use your active imagination. In your mind's eye, 
put yourself somewhere you would feel comfortable, relaxed, and at peace. 3. Spend a few minutes while you are in this relaxed state repeating the lesson title and related thoughts several times, allowing them to become part of your being. 4. Each day ask yourself the question, do I want to experience peace of mind or do I want to experience conflict? 5. Put the lesson title on a card and keep it with you, review it periodically throughout the day and evening, and apply the lesson to everyone and everything without exception. 6. Before retiring, relax and take a few minutes to review the day's lesson. Ask yourself if you would be willing to have these ideas incorporated in your dreams. 7. When you have considered all of the lessons, your learning will be facilitated if you begin again with the first lesson and repeat the entire series. 8. This form of practice may be maintained until you find that you are thinking about the lessons and applying them consistently without needing to refer to them. All that I give is given to myself. To give is to receive, this is the law of love. Under this law, when we give our love away to others we gain, and whatever we give we simultaneously receive. The law of love is based on abundance, we are completely filled with love all the time, and our supply is always full and running over. When we give our love unconditionally to others with no expectations of return, the love within us extends, expands, and joins. So by giving our love away we increase the love within us and everyone gains. The law of the world, on the other hand, states that what we give away we lose. That is to say, when we give something away, we don't have it anymore and suffer loss. The world's law is based on the belief in scarcity. It holds that we are never really satisfied. We continue to feel empty as we vainly attempt to get fulfilled by seeking love and peace in whatever external forms we have come to think of as desirable. The problem, of course, is that nothing in our external world will continuously and totally satisfy us. Under the world's law, we continuously search but never find. We frequently think our inner well is empty and that we are in need. We then try to fulfill our imagined needs through other people. When we expect others to satisfy our desires, and they disappoint us, as they inevitably must, we experience distress. This distress can take the form of frustration, disappointment, anger, depression, or illness. As a result, we are likely to feel trapped, limited, rejected, or attacked. When we are feeling unloved and depressed and empty inside, finding someone to give us love is not really the solution. What is helpful is to love someone else totally and with no expectations. That love, then, is simultaneously given to ourselves. The other person doesn't have to change or give us something. The world's distorted concept is that you have to get other people's love before you can feel love within. The law of love is different from the world's law. The law of love is that you are love, and that as you give love to others you teach yourself what you are. Today allow yourself to learn and experience the law of love. I was mistaken in believing that I could give anyone anything other than what I want for myself. Since we want to experience peace, love, and forgiveness, these are the only gifts I would offer others. It is not charity on my part to offer forgiveness and love to others in place of attack. Rather, offering love is the only way I can accept love for myself. Example A. The following is a letter from Rita, a friend who came into my life in the fall of L978. Rita phoned me to ask for help for her teenage daughter Tina, who had leukemia. Tina died in January of L979. Rita has given me permission to share this letter, which, to me, states with beauty and clarity the essence of today's lesson. All that I give is given to myself. February 27th. Dear Jerry, I hope you don't mind being the recipient of these letters, which are my way of expressing my thoughts as they are starting to emerge from some deep, formerly untouched source. If nothing else, you, as a psychiatrist, know this expression can be therapeutic. Since I last wrote you, other little threads seem to be weaving into this tapestry of life. On February 22nd, I went to hear Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross speak. Needless to say, it was a real experience. One could hardly come away untouched or unmoved. She touched on some sore spots, 
and some portions of her talk were difficult to endure. But her words, her philosophy and her work have made a lasting impression on me, and I feel that what she and you are doing is what it's all about. To continue the chronological events which are taking place, this is what happened the next day. I decided to go to work for that one day. During a break, I walked over to a small shopping mall, which I usually frequent. But as I walked over, I noticed a bookstore that hadn't been there previously. I couldn't help wondering from whence it had materialized. I just had to go and look in. I asked how long the shop had been there and I was told, a month. I looked around and noticed some books that had not yet been put on the shelf. One was a book I had heard about and thought I'd like to read one day. I decided to get it. It was Ruth Montgomery's A World Beyond. I can't even begin to express the way that book hit me. That's a story in itself. But I started to take still another look at my life and ponder where all this was taking me. But, as you said, if the question raised a conflict in me, it wouldn't do me any good. So I didn't dwell on the whys and wherefores. Instead, I reread your letter and thought about the line where you said that one of the best ways of dealing with what I was going through, mourning, would be to find someone to help. I didn't have to go out and search or even rack my brain. I knew all along whom I was supposed to help. As briefly as I can, I will tell you the story. About a year ago, my daughter Tina was beginning to show signs of illness. At the same time, another young woman, 20 years old, who lived two doors away and whom I had known for 15 years, also came down with a still undiagnosed illness. The mother and I spoke about our concern and fears about their conditions. Some time later, when Tina's illness was diagnosed, this lady could not bring herself to talk to me. She never spoke to me the entire time Tina was sick. When Tina was sick, she came to the rosary, but she never said a word. A silent look passed between us. She came to the funeral and then was one of the kind neighbors who brought food to the house afterward. In all this time, she never said anything. I knew I was the reality of what could happen to her daughter. And so afterward I, too, stayed away so I wouldn't remind her. I always asked other neighbors how she was doing, and I always got my information second hand. Then I thought of you and your letters and words. And I thought, why not? I did care. And so I went to see her. As soon as she saw me, she came right over to me and we embraced. It was natural. We knew how each other was feeling. It was just beautiful. I felt so good when I left. I wondered why I took so long to walk those few feet to her house. I guess until that point, I just wasn't ready. But again I say, though you are far away, geographically, spiritually you are close. I will not question anything that happens, but accept it and see where it takes me. Peace to you, Jerry, now and always. Sincerely. Rita. Example B. Some years ago I had the good fortune of spending some time in Los Angeles with Mother Teresa, known for her work with the poor and dying in Calcutta, India and throughout the world. I wanted to meet with her because I knew she demonstrated an almost perfect consistency of living a life of inner peace, and I wanted to learn from her how she did this. We talked about our mutual work with people who were facing life and death situations. I experienced an inner stillness while in her presence. The power of the love, the gentility, the peace of mind that emanated from her is difficult to describe. This was something I wanted to experience and demonstrate in myself. It was the July 4th weekend, and I learned she was flying to Mexico City that afternoon. I asked if I could join her because I wanted to continue being in her presence. She smiled gently and said, Dr. Jampolsky, I would have no objection about your joining me on the trip to Mexico. But you said you wanted to learn about inner peace. I think you would learn more about inner peace if you would find out how much it costs to fly to Mexico City and back and give that money to the poor. I found out the cost of the round-trip flight from Los Angeles to Mexico City and gave that amount to the Brothers of Mercy in Los Angeles. The powerful lesson I learned from Mother Teresa was that I do not have to seek for guidance outside of myself to find out what to do. 
I learned that the time for giving is always now, not later, and that by giving with no expectations or limits, one has immediate inner peace. I learned in that one instant that all I give is given to myself. Today I will give to others only the gifts I want to accept for myself. Forgiveness is the key to happiness. Inner peace can be reached only when we practice forgiveness. Forgiveness is the vehicle for changing our perceptions and letting go of our fears, condemning judgments and grievances. We need to remind ourselves constantly that love is the only reality there is. Anything we perceive that does not mirror love is a misperception. Forgiveness, then, becomes the means for correcting our misperceptions, it allows us to see only the love in others and ourselves, and nothing else. Through selective forgetting, through taking off the tinted glasses that superimpose the fearful past upon the present, we can begin to know that the truth of love is forever present and that by perceiving only love we can experience happiness. Forgiveness then becomes a process of letting go and overlooking whatever we thought other people may have done to us, or whatever we may think we have done to others. When we cherish grievances, we allow our mind to be fed by fear and we become imprisoned by these distortions. When we see our only function as forgiveness, and are willing to practice it consistently by directing our minds to be forgiving, we will find ourselves released and set free. Forgiveness corrects the misperception that we are separate from each other and allows us to experience a sense of unity and at one meant with each other. Forgiveness, as defined here, is different from the way most of us have been trained to understand it. Forgiveness does not mean assuming a position of superiority and putting up with or tolerating behavior in another person that we do not like. Forgiveness means correcting our misperception that the other person harmed us. The unforgiving mind contrasted with the forgiving mind, is confused, afraid, and full of fear. It is certain of the interpretation it places on its perceptions of others. It is certain of the justification of its anger and the correctness of its condemning judgment. The unforgiving mind rigidly sees the past and future as the same and is resistant to change. It does not want the future to be different from the past. The unforgiving mind sees itself as innocent and others as guilty. It thrives on conflict and being right, and it sees inner peace as its enemy. It perceives everything as separate. Whenever I see someone else as guilty, I am reinforcing my own sense of guilt and unworthiness. I cannot forgive myself unless I am willing to forgive others. It does not matter what I think anyone has done to me in the past or what I think I may have done. Only through forgiveness can my release from guilt and fear be complete. Example. The following is a personal vignette that demonstrates some principles about grievances and forgiveness. One morning my secretary brought in a huge pile of bills. She reminded me that my income was down because of the increasing amount of time I was spending on a non-fee basis. She said there was a man who owed me $500 for services rendered to his daughter the previous year, and reminded me how well and quickly the daughter had responded to working with me. Then she said that she was tired of sending the bill and suggested I send it to a collection agency. I told her I had never sent a bill to a collection agency, and didn't plan to do that now, but I would give some thought to the matter. As I looked at the unpaid bills I owed, I began to feel what I thought was justified anger, and I felt I had a legitimate grievance. After all, I had done my part, and he and his daughter had benefited from working with me. I knew her father could well afford to pay the fee, and I began to think he was a louse for not paying. I made up my mind to phone him that afternoon. While meditating on my daily lesson from A Course in Miracles, which was forgiveness is the key to happiness, a picture of this man who owed me money came across my mind. I heard an inner voice state that I was to let go of the past and my attachment to the money. I was to practice forgiveness and heal my relationship with him. So I phoned him. I told him about my meditation and my decision to send no more bills. I told him of my past anger and of my determination not to retain it. I said I was calling to heal our relationship, and that the money was no longer an issue. There was a long pause before he said, Well, if I don't pay your bill, certainly God is not going to. I said I thought it important to let go of the money issue and the anger I had felt toward him regarding the bill. I told him I was releasing myself from the thought that he had hurt me in any way. There was another silence, 
and his voice became warm and loving. He thanked me for phoning and then to my surprise he said he would mail the check next week, which he did. The next hour I saw a mother of an 11-year-old girl who had cancer of the spine and was a member of one of our groups at the center. The mother had been receiving public assistance, but because of many complexities was not able to obtain money through the so our other channels. Her car had been repaired and was waiting for her at the garage, but she could not pay the $70 repair bill. Because of the car problem, she had missed essential appointments for her daughter's chemotherapy treatments. My inner voice said, give her the $70 since you have just found money that you thought you didn't have. When I did this, I experienced inner peace. I continue to be impressed by how quickly I experience inner peace when I let go of my attachment to the past belief that someone is guilty and someone is innocent. Today I choose to let go of all my past misperceptions about myself and others. Instead, I will join with everyone and say, I see you and myself only in the light of true forgiveness. I am never upset for the reason I think. Most of us have a belief system based on experiences from the past and on perceptions from the physical senses. Have you considered that what we believe is what we see? Or, as the late Flip Wilson put it, what you see is what you get. Because our physical senses appear to relay information from the outside world to our brain, we may believe that our state of mind is controlled entirely by the feedback we receive. This belief contributes to a sense of ourselves as separate entities who are largely isolated and feel alone in an uncaring and fragmented world. This can leave us with the impression that the world we see causes us to feel upset, depressed, anxious, and fearful. Such a belief system presumes that the outside world is the cause and we are the effect. Let us consider the possibility that this type of thinking is upside down and backwards. What would happen if we believed that what we see is determined by the thoughts in our mind? Perhaps we could entertain an idea that at the moment seems unnatural and foreign to us, namely, that our thoughts are the cause and what we see is the effect. It would then make no sense to blame the world or those in it for the miseries and pain we experience, because it would be possible then to consider perception as a mirror and not a fact. Consider once again that the mind may be like a motion picture camera, projecting our internal state onto the world. When our mind is filled with upsetting thoughts, we see the world and those in it as upsetting to us. On the other hand, when our mind is peaceful, the world and the people in it appear to us as peaceful. You can choose to awaken in the morning and see a friendly world through glasses that filter out everything except love. It may be helpful to question our need to attempt to control the external world. We can, instead, control our inner world by consistently choosing what thoughts we want to have in our mind. Peace of mind begins with our own thoughts and extends outward. It is from our peace of mind, cause, that a peaceful perception of the world arises, effect. We all have the power to direct our minds to replace the feelings of being upset, depressed, and fearful with the feeling of inner peace. I am tempted to believe that I am upset because of what other people do or because of circumstances and events that seem beyond my control. I may experience being upset as some form of anger, jealousy, resentment, or depression. Actually, all of these feelings represent some form of fear that I am experiencing. When I recognize that I always have the choice between being fearful or experiencing love by extending love to others, I need no longer be upset for any reason. Example For many years I had been bothered by chronic disabling back pain. Through those years I was not able to play tennis, garden, or do many of the things that I liked to do. I was hospitalized several times, and at one point the neurosurgeon wanted to perform surgery on what was called an organic back disease a degenerative disc. I chose not to have the surgery. I thought I was upset because of the pain and the distress caused by it. Then one day there seemed to be a small voice inside that said, even though I had an organic back syndrome, I was causing my own pain. It became clear to me that my back condition became worse when I was under emotional stress, particularly when I was fearful and holding a grievance against someone. I was not upset for the reason I thought. As I learned to let go of my grievances through the practice of forgiveness, my pain disappeared. I now have no limitations on my activities. I thought I had been upset because of back pain. 
I found, however, I was upset because of unhealed personal relationships. I had let myself believe that the body controls the mind, rather than realizing that the mind controls the body. I feel certain that most people who have back problems have the potential to learn to let go of their grievances, their guilt and fears, and through forgiveness of others and themselves experience their own healing. Throughout the day, whenever you are tempted to be fearful, remind yourself that you can experience love instead. I am determined to see things differently. The world we see that seems so insane may be the result of a belief system that isn't working. The belief system holds that the fearful past will extend into a fearful future, making the past and the future one. It is our memory of fear and pain that makes us feel so vulnerable. It is this feeling of vulnerability that makes us want to control and predict the future at all costs. I would like to present a personal example. I was reared in a family where a fearful attitude always seemed to prevail. I bought into a philosophy that said, the past was awful, the moment is horrendous, and the next moment is going to be worse. And, of course, we were all correct in our predictions since we shared the same assumptions. Our old belief system assumes that anger occurs because we have been attacked. It also assumes that counterattack is justified in return, and that we are responsible for protecting ourselves, but are not responsible for the need to do so. If we are willing, it is possible to change our belief system. However, to do so we must take a new look at every one of our cherished assumptions and values from the past. This means letting go of any investment in holding on to fear, anger, guilt, or pain. It means letting the past slip away and with it all the fears from the past that we keep extending into the present and future. I am determined to see things differently means that we are truly willing to get rid of the past and future in order to experience now as it really is. Most of my life I have acted as if I were a robot, responding to what other people said or did. Now I recognize that my responses are determined only by the decisions I make. I claim my freedom by exercising the power of my decision to see people and events with love instead of fear. Example A. When I was in medical school, a surprising percentage of the class came down with whatever disease was being discussed. It made no difference what the disease was, it could have been hepatitis, schizophrenia, or syphilis. My thing was tuberculosis. When I was an intern in Boston I had to spend one month on the TB service, and I was scared to death that I would catch it and die. My fantasy plan was to take one deep breath as I went on the ward and not breathe for a month. I was a total wreck at the end of my first day. That night about 11.30 I received an emergency call. I ran to the ward where a 50-year-old woman, who not only had tuberculosis but was also an alcoholic with cirrhosis of the liver, had just vomited blood. She had no pulse. I massaged her heart and removed the blood from her throat with a suction machine. The oxygen machine would not work at first, and I administered mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Her pulse came back, and she began to breathe. After I went back to my intern quarters I saw myself in the mirror, and I was a bloody mess. All of a sudden it occurred to me that I had not been fearful at any time during the episode. That night I learned that when I was totally absorbed in what I might get, I was immobilized with fear and a help to no one, but when I was totally absorbed in giving, I felt no fear. By letting go of the past, by putting my full attention into giving in the now, I forgot about fear and could see things differently. Perhaps it is needless to say I immediately lost my fear of tuberculosis. That patient turned out to be a very potent teacher for me. Our state of mind is our responsibility. Whether we experience peace or conflict is determined by the choices we make, how we see other people, and whether we see them as worthy of love or as justifying our fear. We do not have to act like robots and give others the power to determine whether we will experience love or fear, happiness, or sadness. Example B. This book emphasizes that a shift in perception can reverse our way of thinking, it helps when you put the cart in front of the horse. I find that when personal guidance has established the goal, the cart, all I need to do is keep that goal firmly in my mind and the means, the horse, will take care of itself. Most of us expend so much energy in trying to find the means that we lose sight of the goal. Here is an example. 
The children I work with who have catastrophic illnesses recently wrote a book. It looked as if it would take 18 or more months to get it published at an established publishing house. Although we did not have any money, my guidance was not to wait but to publish the book ourselves, and to have faith that somehow the money would be provided. In the past I would never have done anything like this without having the money first. This time, however, I was determined to see things differently. I did make a personal commitment to the printer that I would borrow the money from the bank if we were not able to raise the necessary funds. On Friday at noon, the 5,000 copies of the book, There is a Rainbow Behind Every Dark Cloud, were delivered. We had raised less than L0% of the money required. I felt as if I were at the end of a high diving board and someone was about to push me off. However, one hour later we received a phone call from the executive director of the Bothan Foundation, stating that they had approved our grant application and we would immediately receive a check paying for the books in full. Through this experience, I learned that nothing is impossible when we follow our inner guidance, even when its direction may threaten us by reversing our usual logic. Whenever you feel tempted today to see through the eyes of fear, repeat to yourself with determination. I am not a robot, I am free. I am determined to see things differently. I can escape from the world I see by giving up attack thoughts. Many of us feel at times that we are hopelessly trapped in the world we see. Try as we may, we just can't seem to change the world and escape from its seeming confines. If we remember that it is our thoughts that make up the world, then we can change them. We change the world we see by changing our thoughts about it. By changing our thoughts, we are actually changing the cause. Then the world we see, the effect, will change automatically. A changed thought system can reverse cause and effect as we have known it. For most of us, this is a very difficult concept to accept because we resist relinquishing the predictability of our past belief system and so resist assuming responsibility for our thoughts, feelings, and reactions. Since we always look within before looking out, we can perceive attack outside us only when we have first accepted attack as real within. We forget this premise when we perceive another person as attacking us. We try to hide from our conscious awareness that the attack we perceive is coming from elsewhere actually originated in our mind. When we recognize this, we can become aware that our own attack thoughts are actually hurting us. We may then choose to replace attack thoughts with love thoughts in order to stop hurting ourselves. Our higher self-interest brings with it the understanding that the love we give others strengthens the love we have for ourselves. Once again, it may be worthwhile to remind ourselves that attack thoughts do not bring us peace of mind and justifying our anger doesn't really protect us. I recognize today that my attack thoughts about others are really directed against myself. When I believe that attacking others brings me something I want, let me remember that I always attack myself first. I do not wish to hurt myself again today. Example The Center for Attitudinal Healing has recently received considerable national publicity through television and other media because of our work with children with catastrophic diseases. We have because of the thousands of letters received, started a national and international pen pal and telephone network in which children around the world are finding peace by helping each other. This work was producing enormous telephone bills, and we were in need of money. Because I was preoccupied with this problem, I was quieting my mind through meditation, and the thought occurred to me that I was to call the president of the phone company and elicit his financial help. I found this guidance difficult to accept for two reasons. The first was that I felt I had already paid my dues in asking people for money and just did not want to do that anymore. The second reason was that one of my pet hates was the telephone company. My phone was frequently out of order, and I often found myself irritated and angry at the telephone company. However, my inner voice was persistent. I felt that I could not call them while I was still angry. So what I did was to spend the next two weeks practicing forgiveness and letting go of my attack thoughts. To my surprise I was then able to feel a sense of oneness, adjoining, and love between me and the people at the telephone company. I then tried to phone the company president and, of course, couldn't get through to him. My fantasy was that there were about 50 people protecting him from callers who were angry and wanted to complain. 
I always got the same message. The president is busy and can't talk to you now. After calling him four times, I decided to try only once more. To my surprise, he answered the phone himself. I told him why I wanted to see him and, rather than referring me to their public relations department, he made an appointment with me. He could not have been more cordial. Almost immediately, a committee from the phone company began to evaluate the center, and six weeks later we were awarded a $3,000 grant. Now, as far as I am concerned, that was a miracle. And in my heart I do not believe this miracle could even have happened until I was willing to let go of my attack thoughts and allow the love, that was already there, to be revealed. Throughout the day when you are tempted to hurt yourself through attack thoughts, say with determination. I want to experience peace of mind right now. I happily let go of all attack thoughts and choose peace instead. I am not the victim of the world I see. Have you noticed how often you feel that you are a victim of the world in which you live? Because most of us perceive many aspects of our surroundings as insane, we are tempted to feel helplessly caught in a trap. When we allow ourselves to think we are living in an unfriendly environment where we must fear being hurt or victimized, we can only suffer. To be consistent in achieving inner peace, we must perceive a world where everyone is innocent. What happens when we choose to see others as free from guilt? How can we begin to look at them differently? To begin with, we might have to look on everything in the past as irrelevant except the love we have experienced. We could choose to see the world through the window of love rather than the window of fear. That would mean we would then selectively choose to see the beauty and the love in the world, people's strengths rather than their weaknesses. What I see without is a reflection of what I have seen within my own mind. I always project onto the world the thoughts, feelings, and attitudes that preoccupy me. I can see the world differently by changing my mind about what I want to see. Example A. In the past, I thought it was healthy and culturally supported to feel paranoid when walking into a dealership to buy a car. Car salesmen were not to be trusted. To be suspicious of them was as normal as it was wise, and I could have given you selected experiences to prove my case. What I did not realize was that all this approach was doing for me was to eliminate my choices. I found myself with only one attitude, that of fear and suspicion. Peace of mind was impossible. I was not even aware that the salesman was probably operating from his own set of selected past experiences that taught him to be distrustful of customers. He had learned that they were disrespectful and had only some form of degradation to offer. By seeing himself as being perceived by his customers as a second-class citizen, all he was accomplishing was to see himself that way. The car salesman and I had one thing in common, a perception of each other that was totally distorted. And the means by which we had blurred out vision was the same. We had selected only certain aspects from our pasts to form a judgment by which we measured each other in the present. I am now consulting at a large car agency, and I find that my attitudes are changing. Together, we are exploring letting go of our past grievances, and we are putting our efforts into practicing forgiveness. What would happen if customers and car salesmen clearly saw the past as irrelevant and could thereby release it, and so become love finders rather than fault finders, love givers rather than love seekers? Perhaps, then, we would all be free to approach each other with the extension of peace as our only motivation. The misperception I am the victim of the world I see could then be changed to I am not the victim of the world I see. Example B. Through others hearing about our work at the center, I was asked to see Joe, a 15-year-old boy whose head had been run over twice by a tractor. He was rendered blind, mute and sensationless, with a bilateral spastic paralysis. He was in a coma for months, and the doctors felt even a miracle would not help him. However, his family never gave up hope for Joe's improvement and tried to live one day at a time, making the utmost of their now. As Joe began to regain consciousness, he worked hard and was determined to recover completely. Then, what seemed like a series of miracles began to happen. Joe recovered his speech and began to walk throughout this period he spent much time helping others. When I saw him, Joe's spirits seemed to be up almost all the time. I asked him how he maintained this mood, and he replied, Oh, 
I just look at the positive things in everyone, and pay no attention to the negative things, and refuse to believe in the word impossible. Joe doesn't often feel sorry for himself. He could feel that the universe had dealt him a horrible blow. However, he chooses peace instead of conflict by deciding to see the world and those in it through the window of love. There is a choice. To me, Joe is pure love. He just exudes it. He and his family are powerful teachers of love for me and many others. He perfectly exemplifies the statement, I am not the victim of the world I see. Sometimes when I am feeling down, I think of Joe. I am then reminded that I, too, can choose not to see myself as a victim of the world I see. Throughout the day, whenever you are tempted to see yourself as victimized, repeat, only my loving thoughts are real. It is only these I would have in this situation, specify, or with that person, specify. Today I will judge nothing that occurs. Have you ever given yourself the opportunity of going through just one day concentrating on totally accepting everyone and making no judgments? Most of us think we would find that a very difficult task, since it is a rare occurrence to spend a few moments, let alone a whole day, with someone without making a judgment. When we think about it, many of us will be appalled at how often we condemn others and ourselves. We may even feel that it is almost impossible to stop being judgmental. However, all that is really necessary is our willingness to practice being non-judgmental, without expecting instant perfection. The relinquishing of old habits that we do not want comes with repeated and sustained practice. Most of us manifest a condition that could be called tunnel vision. We do not see people as a whole. We see just a fragment of a person, and our mind often interprets what we see as a fault. Most of us were brought up in a home and school environment where emphasis was placed on constructive criticism, which actually is usually a disguise for fault finding. On those occasions when we observe ourselves repeating this same mistake with our spouses, our children, our friends, or even someone seen only casually, it may be helpful for us to quiet our minds, observe our thoughts, and become aware that being a fault finder is totally dependent on our past experiences. Evaluating and being evaluated by others, a habit from the past, result at worst in fear and at best in conditional love. To experience unconditional love, we must get rid of the evaluator part of ourselves. In place of the evaluator, we need to hear our strong inner voice saying to ourselves and others, I totally love and accept you as you are. As we reinforce our decision to be only love finders, it becomes easier for us to concentrate on the strengths of others and overlook their weaknesses. It is important that we apply this lesson to everyone, including ourselves. That means that we can also see ourselves in a loving way. Not judging others is another way of letting go of fear and experiencing love. When we learn not to judge others, and totally accept them, and not want to change them, we can simultaneously learn to accept ourselves. Everything we think, say, or do reacts on us like a boomerang. When we send our judgments in the form of criticism, fury, or other attack thoughts, they come back to us. When we refrain from making judgments and send out only love, it comes back to us. Today, be willing not to make a condemning judgment against anyone you meet, or even think about. See everyone you meet or think about as either extending love or as being fearful and sending out a call for help which is a request for love. Example A. I recently had a powerful learning experience in regard to my attack thoughts. It had been a particularly busy day. I had arranged to have a boy with terminal brain cancer and his mother fly from Connecticut to California late in the afternoon. That evening I brought them to the center. There was a meeting that night with other children who had catastrophic illness. After it was over I took them back to my home and returned to the center to assist in another meeting of adults who had various forms of cancer. That meeting was to be over at 9.30 p.m., and I was to go to a friend's house to meet some guests from India. When I started to leave the center, there was a young man of about 18 years of age waiting to see me. He had a beard, was untidy in appearance, and smelled like he had not had a bath in weeks. He said he wanted to talk to me. I was tired and anxious to leave and didn't really want to see anyone who had a problem. He said he had just arrived after hitchhiking from Virginia, 
that he had seen me on a national television show and felt guided to meet me. My inner thoughts became quite judgmental. He must be disturbed to come across the country to meet me because he saw me on television. His request seemed like a demand and an attack. I told him I had another appointment that evening and that I could see him the next day if he thought he could wait. He said he could wait. The next day he was not able to be specific about what he wanted except to say there was something in my eyes that made him want to see me. Since neither of us seemed to know why he was there, I suggested that we meditate together and that perhaps we might get an answer. As we meditated, I was surprised to hear a clear inner voice state, this man came across the country as a gift to you to tell you he saw perfect love in your eyes something that you have difficulty seeing in yourself. Your gift to him is to demonstrate total acceptance to him, something he has never in his life experienced. I shared with him what I had heard, and we embraced each other. I was amazed to realize that the awful odor I had smelled only a moment before had totally disappeared. Tears came down both of our faces, and a mutual peace and love was experienced that is difficult to describe. A healing had taken place for both of us. Attack thoughts had been replaced by love thoughts. We truly had been teachers and psychotherapists for each other. We departed in extreme joy. I had a feeling I would never see him again but that I would never forget the lesson of forgiveness that he had taught me. Example B. I think most of us can identify with the man who goes to a fashionable restaurant for dinner and finds the service simply awful and the server brusque, rude and unfriendly. We can also identify with what would seem like justified anger a reasonable grievance, hostile fantasies, and his decision to leave the server no tip. To have inner peace as our single goal, we need to correct the erroneous belief that justified anger or grievances bring us peace. Anger and attack simply do not bring peace of mind. Now let us start this small drama over again. This time I whisper into the patron's ear, just as he sits down that the server's husband died two days ago and that she has five children at home who are solely dependent on her for their support. Now, he can see the waitress as fearful, and recognize that she is giving a call for love. He can now respond by seeing her strength and devotion, and he finds he can overlook, forgive, her behavior. His response now is a loving, accepting attitude that he demonstrates by leaving an extra large tip. The external form of what is seen by the eyes and ears is the same in both dramas. However, in the first script, the events are seen through the window of fear, and in the second, through the windows of love. Today, allow yourself to have the single goal of inner peace by putting all your attention on the following thoughts, today, I will view without judgment everything that ours. All events provide me with another opportunity to experience love in place of fear. This instant is the only time their island. I have often thought that we have much to learn from infants. They have not yet adapted to the concept of linear time with a past, present, and future. They relate only to the immediate present, to right now. My hunch is that they do not see the world as fragmented. They feel that they are joined to everything in the world as part of a whole. To me, they represent true innocence, love, wisdom, and forgiveness. As we get older, we tend to accept the adult values that emphasize projecting past learning into the present and anticipated future. It is difficult for most of us to have even the slightest question about the validity of our past-present-future concepts. We believe that the past will continue to repeat itself in the present and future without the possibility of change. Consequently, we believe we are living in a fear-filled world where, sooner or later, there will be suffering, frustrations, conflict, depression, and illness. When we hold on to, invest in, and become attached to our guilty experiences and grievances form the past, we are tempted to predict a similar future. The future and the past then become one. We feel vulnerable when we believe that the fearful past is real and forget that our only reality is love, and that love exists this instant. Feeling vulnerable, we expect that the past will repeat itself. We see what we expect, and what we expect we both invite and seek. Past guilt and fears are thereby continually recycled. One way of letting go of our archaeological garbage is to recognize that holding on to it does not bring us what we want. When we see no value in recycling it, 
we remove the blocks to our being free to forgive and love completely now. Only in this way can we be truly happy. This instant is the only time there is can become an eternity. The future becomes an extension of a peaceful present that never ceases. My preoccupation with the past and its projection into the future defeats any aims of present peace. The past is over and the future is yet to be. Peace cannot be found in the past or future, but only in this instant. I am determined to live today without either past or future fantasies. I will remind myself, this instant is the only time there is. Example The following letter is from a nurse named Carol who has become a dear friend. We had previously talked together about how healing, the inner peace that comes from letting go of fear, can take place in an instant. Dear Jerry, Recently I've been in numerous situations where I've talked on and on about unconditional love and the importance of honoring the very essence of one's own being by letting go of fear. I guess we talk most about the very things we are learning. In a dream, I was sitting face to face with a human being ugly, fearful, deformed, and miserable. For a brief instant I wanted to run away. But as I relaxed into myself, I saw the very real connection between us and I loved this connection. As I saw the illusional aspect of the ego interpretation fade away, a bright light emitted the radiance, divinity and innocence nobody had seen before. I embraced this person with a genuine love I'd never experienced. This person received my love, and there was a rejoicing and a communion with a spiritual merging of souls. This person was myself and I was this person, we celebrated our oneness. I knew the real feeling of love, honor, and forgiveness. I shall never forget the absolute and complete healing that took place in an instant. I truly understand what you were saying now. In truth and love, Carol. I wanted to share this beautiful letter with you because gifts are to be shared. I continue to find Carol's letter helpful to me at those times when I become attached to the past and am having trouble forgiving myself and others. This instant is the only time there is. The past is over, it can tough me not. When we think we have been hurt by someone in the past, we build up defenses to protect ourselves from being hurt in the future. So the fearful past causes a fearful future, and the past and future become one. We cannot love when we feel fear. We cannot love when we feel guilt. When we release the fearful past and forgive everyone, we will experience total love and oneness with all. We seem to consider it natural to use our experiences of the past as reference points from which to judge the present. This results in our seeing the present with distorted dark colored glasses. Familiarity may not always breed contempt, but it is likely to dull our perceptions of those with whom we have close relationships. If we are to see our spouse, boss, or co-workers as they truly are, we must see them now, by recognizing their past and our own have no validity in the present. To let each second be a new birth experience is to look without condemnation on the present. It results in totally releasing others and ourselves from all the errors of the past. It allows us to breathe freely and experience the miracle of love by sharing this mutual release. It allows for an instant healing where love is ever present, here and now. It is our investment in wanting to control and predict that keeps us attached to the painful and guilty experience of the past. Guilt and fear which are allied and which our minds make up, stimulate us to believe in this continuity of time. If we feel that someone rejected us, criticized us, or was unfair to us in the past, we will see that person as attacking us. This reinforces our fear, and we attempt to attack back. Releasing the past means not blaming anyone, including ourselves. It means holding no grievances and totally accepting everyone, making no exceptions. It means a willingness to see only the light in others, and not their lampshade. Fear and love, guilt and love, cannot coexist. Only if I keep reliving the past in the future am I a slave to time. By forgiving and letting go of the past, I free myself of the painful burdens I have carried into the present. Now I can claim the opportunities for freedom in the present without my past distortions. Example In 1975, I conducted a seminar on a course in miracles a few months after I had become a student of these writings. At the intermission, 
a couple in their 60s came up to me and said they were going to visit their 35-year-old son, a chronic schizophrenic, in the state hospital the next day. They asked my advice about how to apply the principles of the course to their visit. I didn't really know what to say, so I asked my intuitive self for guidance. What came out of my mouth surprised me. The words didn't seem like mine, although they will be familiar to you because they have since become part of me and therefore part of this book. I responded by saying, Spend as much time as you can before tomorrow ridding yourself of all the past, painful guilty, fearful thoughts and experiences you have had with your son. Release yourselves from any guilt you have about your son's condition. Use your active imagination and put all your fears, guilt and pain in a garbage can and attach it to a yellow balloon filled with helium. Print on the balloon, I forgive my misperceptions. Then watch the balloon and garbage can disappear into the sky. Pay attention to how much lighter and freer you feel. When you go to the hospital and the doctor talks to you about your son's behavior, do not be attached to what he says. Look past what your eyes and ears report. Choose to see your son only through the window of love. Choose to see your son only as light the light of love. See the light of love in your son and the light of your love as one light. Feel the peaceful bliss and know that the function of love is to unite all things unto itself. A week later I received a beautiful gift, a letter from the parents saying that they had experienced the most peaceful visit with their son they had ever had. Today I choose to claim my release from past pains and suffering by living only in the immediate present. I could see peace instead of this. Most of us go through life with the belief system that our happiness or unhappiness is largely determined by the events in our environment and reactions of other people to us. Frequently we feel that our happiness is dependent on good or bad luck for which we bear little responsibility. We forget to instruct our minds to change our perceptions of the world and everything in it. We forget that peace of mind is an internal matter and that it comes from a peaceful mind that a peaceful perception of the world is experienced. The temptation to react with anger, depression or excitement exists because of interpretations we make of the external stimuli in our environment. Such interpretations are necessarily based on incomplete perception. When we dwell on past events or anticipate future happenings, we are living in the realm of fantasy. Whatever is real in our lives can only be experienced now. We block the possibility of fresh and novel experiences in our lives when we attempt to relieve in the present our memories of episodes from the past, whether painful or pleasurable. We are, therefore, in a continual state of conflict about the actual happenings of the present and are unable to directly experience the opportunities for happiness that are all about us. Most of the time I see a fragmented world where nothing seems to make much sense. The bits and pieces of my daily experience reflect the chaos I see within. Today, I welcome a new perception of myself in the world. Example A. When my mother was 88 years old, I was a 54-year-old man who frequently found himself wanting to please her, and to change the many situations that made her unhappy. When I found my efforts were unsuccessful, I felt uneasy and I was tempted to perceive my mother as demanding and rejecting when she was simply asking for help. I find that I need to remember that I am responsible for the emotions I experience, and that my mother didn't cause my lack of peace, I did. The lesson, I could see peace instead of this, reminds me that the choice is between peace and conflict. When consistently practicing this lesson I then can choose to see my mother differently. I can choose to accept my mother without wanting to change her. This perception leads to seeing the love that exists between us and the recognition that she continues to be a most significant teacher of mine. Example B. When we are ill, the temptation is to complain, pity ourselves, focus attention on our bodies, and feel disabled by our discomfort and pain. In this state, our feelings of anger, irritability and depression only reinforce a generalized sense of helplessness and hopelessness. We are finding in our work with the children at the center that through our willingness to help others we can learn to be happy rather than depressed. These children are teaching us that when we are ill or disabled, we can choose to direct our minds away from our bodies and their ailments and focus all our attention on being truly helpful to others. The moment we put our attention on helping someone, we cease to perceive ourselves as ill or in pain, 
and find meaning in the statement, to give is to receive. Repeat to yourself whenever you feel that your peace is threatened by anything or anyone, I choose to see the unity of peace instead of the fragmentation of fear. I could see peace instead of this. I can elect to change all thoughts that hurt. That free will and choice are inherent attributes of the mind is something most of us tend to forget. We have all had the experience of feeling trapped in a situation where there seemed to be no escape. Here is a suggestion that may prove helpful under such circumstances. You can use active imagination to find a way out. Picture a wall and let it represent your problem. On this wall, paint a door and hang a red exit sign above it. Imagine yourself opening the door, walking through it, and shutting it firmly behind you. Your problem is no longer with you, since you have left it behind. Experience your newfound freedom by imagining yourself in a place where you have no worries and there is nothing to do other than what you would enjoy. When you are ready to leave your happy retreat, bring with you this newfound sense of release from past problem-solving attempts. In the freshness of your new perception, solutions previously unavailable to you will now occur. If we perceive things not as problems but rather as opportunities for learning, we can experience a sense of joy and well-being when the lessons are learned. We are never presented with lessons until we are ready to learn them. In my mind are thoughts that can hurt me or help me. I am constantly choosing the contents of my mind, since no one else can make this choice for me. I can choose to let go of everything but my loving thoughts. Example The following personal vignette may help to illustrate today's lesson. The episode took place in 1951 at Stanford Lane Hospital, which was then located in San Francisco. The situation was one in which I felt trapped and immobilized by fear. I experienced emotional pain and thought I was being threatened with potential physical pain. The past was certainly coloring my perception of the present, and I was surely not experiencing inner peace or joy. I was called at 2 a.m. one Sunday morning to see a patient on the locked psychiatric ward who had suddenly gone berserk. The patient, whom I had not seen before, had been admitted the previous afternoon with a diagnosis of acute schizophrenia. About 10 minutes before I saw him, he had removed the wooden molding around the door. I looked through the small window in the door, and saw a man 6 feet 4 inches tall weighing 280 pounds. He was running around the room nude carrying this large piece of wood with nails sticking out, and talking gibberish. I really didn't know what to do. There were two male nurses, both of whom seemed scarcely five feet tall, who said, We will be right behind you, document. I didn't find that reassuring. As I continued to look through the window, I began to recognize how scared the patient was, and then it began to trickle into my consciousness how scared I was. All of a sudden it occurred to me that he and I had a common bond that might allow for unity, namely, we were both scared. Not knowing what else to do, I yelled through the thick door, My name is Dr. Jem Polsky and I want to come in and help you, but I'm scared. I'm scared that I might get hurt, and I'm scared you might get hurt, and I can't help wondering if you aren't scared, too. With this, he stopped his gibberish, turned around and said, You're goddamn right. I'm scared. I continued yelling to him, telling him how scared I was, and he was yelling back how scared he was. In a sense we became therapists to each other. As we talked, our fear disappeared and our voices calmed down. He then allowed me to walk in alone, talk with him, give him some oral medication, and leave. That was a very powerful and important learning experience for me. At first I saw the patient as a potential enemy who was going to hurt me. My past told me that anyone who seemed disturbed and had a club in his hand was dangerous. I chose not to use the manipulative device of authority, which would have only served the purpose of creating more fear and separation. When I found a common bond in our fearful attitudes and sincerely asked for his help, he joined me. We were then in a position of helping each other. When I saw this patient as my teacher rather than my enemy, he helped me recognize that perhaps we are all equally insane and that it is only the form of our insanity that is different. I am determined today that all my thoughts be free from fear, guilt, or condemnation, whether of myself or others, by repeating, I can elect to change all thoughts that hurt. 
I am responsible for what I see. I choose the feelings I experience, and I decide upon the goal I would achieve. And everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for, and receive as I have asked. Teach only love for that is what you are. Epilogue Let us consistently choose the single goal of peace rather than multiple goals that lead to conflict. Let us continue to practice forgiveness and to see each other and ourselves as blameless. Let us look lovingly upon the present, for it holds only knowledge that is forever true. Let us continue to be involved in a process of personal transformation in which we are only concerned about giving, and not about getting. Let us recognize that we are united as one self and illuminate the world with the light of love that shines through us. Let us awaken to the knowledge that the essence of our being is love, and, as such, we are the light of the world.